sustainability discourse, to think about environmental justice in the context of racial justice and social justice, and then to kind of expand our ideas about what does it mean to uh, put indigenous peoples at the center of the work that we're going to do as we move forward with what does climate resiliency look like? What does sustainability look like in community? And um, how can we make sure that we are participating in a way that doesn't repeat sort of colonialism over again? So we've had some really great panels and today's panel is specifically going to be about uh, talking a little bit about uh, the ways in which we can see bringing indigenous action toward the forefront of what it looks like to save our earth. And we recommended people reading The Red Deal, uh, which is The Red Deal, Indigenous Action to Save Our Earth by the Red Nation, uh, to say this is a start of how you can start to think differently about what, what does it mean to move for environmental sustainability. Um, we are gonna be giving away a copy of the book today. And so if you stay until the end of the panel, we'll be doing a drawing of people who are here in the session and uh, you have to be present to win. So far, everybody who's won has been present. So I think it brings good luck if you stay until the end, uh, you can win a copy of the book. I think that one thing that I wanted to bring to light as we get started very quickly for people is one particular part of the book. It's, very, it's in the very beginning on page six um, when they start talking about what do indigenous peoples want? And that at the heart of this book is talking about like, well, what does it mean? Like if we're thinking about environmental justice and social justice, if we're thinking about sustainability, what do indigenous peoples want? And you have um, a quote here uh, from Denzel Sutherland Wilson. People get confused about what we want as native people. Uh, he said, referring to the eviction of the coastal gas link pipeline company from the lands of the Wet'suwet'en nation. Quote, it's like, what do you want? Just land back, end quote. And they talk about how the crux of the so-called Indian problem in the Western hemisphere hinges on the question, what do Indians want? But for us, it's a larger social problem of underdevelopment. Colonialism has deprived indigenous peoples and all people who are affected by it of the means to develop according to our needs, principles, and values. It begins with the land. We have been made Indians only because we have the most precious commodity to the settler states, land. Vigilante, cop, and soldier often stand between us, our connections to land and justice. Land back strikes fear in the heart of the settler. But as we show here, it's the soundest environmental policy for a planet teetering on the brink of total ecological collapse. The path forward is simple. It's decolonization or extinction, and that starts with land back. So I think that those are some very key moments for me of what we're going to hopefully bring into conversation today, and that I've heard this in multiple places. It's decolonization or extinction, and that starts with land back. So I'm going to share a couple of really quick slides to give some context to this discussion around land back. I think we always get people joining the conversation around land back in very different places from their understandings of what this means. And I uh, actually did a talk the day before yesterday about land acknowledgements and land back. And one of the people asked these questions about that. What does that even look like? And I said, here's a, li here's a link to a video of what that looks like of the Wiat tribe getting their sacred land back. I've answered that question. That's what it looks like. And they were like, no, what about all the scary parts of land return? You're not talking about the scary things. You're not talking about the scary parts. And, we, and because it was a very short webinar, I couldn't go into like, what's the scary parts? And what are we really talking about here? I will tell you this, There, in my mind, there's actually no scary parts about land back it's actually all just really positive awesome parts and the scary parts are all things that i could actually fix pretty easily with some pretty great answers but the first thing i will tell you is if you're scared of land back it's because what you're really scared of is that you've been taught by a settler colonial culture that somehow land ownership is power and you're really thinking about the loss of power and what that means and I always point out to people, nobody said anybody's going to lose any like power in this situation, except for the state, the settler state. The settler state will lose power. And the settler state is not on your side. It is actually not here to protect you and uplift you. Nobody, right? Except for very, except for billionaires and corporations. 
um, who I don't think we need to worry that much about. They're fine. Uh, so the rest of us need to think about what it means and how we can kind of sign up for this. So I'm gonna start today with a land acknowledgement. Um, my land acknowledgement reads like this. We begin by acknowledging that all land which we currently occupy is dispossessed indigenous land. It is important that we know the name of the tribal peoples on whose land we reside, and that by acknowledging this continuing relationship to land by indigenous peoples, we center their voices, knowledges, contributions, struggles, and ongoing issues in a meaningful way that compels us toward action. And acknowledgement should not be wrote actions read at the beginning of an event to excuse settler colonial occupation, but instead a call for us all to work toward the return of land. Our obligation is to make meaningful our relationships to the lands we occupy. I am joining you today from the land of the Wiat peoples, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Arcata is known as Gutini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Wiat peoples continue to remain in relationship to these lands through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. They are important parts of not only the history of the area, but also in continuing knowledges of this place. We always end our land acknowledgements, hopefully with actions, things that people can do so that they can start this process of like, well, how am I building relationship to the places and peoples of the land of which I occupy? We offer you here some courses of action, like HSU Native American Studies on Facebook, follow HSU Native American Studies on Instagram, find a meaningful action in your own community that you can donate or support to, know the tribal peoples whose lands you're on, and then look up what are they doing and what do they need help with, and how are you gonna contribute to that. Pay the We Ought Honor Tax today, of which they're sharing many of these links into the chat, and donate to the NAS Food Sovereignty Lab sort of an interdisciplinary intertribal connection at Humboldt State so that we can do the work to build food sovereignty and cultural resource uh, protection in our region. Um, any donation helps uh, to, so to show the support for something like a program like the Food Sovereignty Lab. So next, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna very quickly go over a couple of things that a lot of people don't know and that I think actually really helps to set context about what we're doing when we're talking about land back. So the first thing that I will say is um, a lot of people approach land back like they are, like it is a very scary thing. I will say it's actually a very straightforward thing. Nationally white families are significantly wealthier than all other racial and ethnic groups combined. You will notice that all groups combined do not equal the same amount of money that most white families are making if you're talking about household median net worth. Next slide. Uh, the five largest land owners in America, all white, own more rural land than all of Black America combined. White Americans, by comparison, own more than 98% of U.S. land, amounting to 856 million acres, with a total of over $1 trillion. So when we think about who owns land and who we're talking about when we're like land back, you're really looking at a great disparity. There is not equity in land ownership. We're talking about a colonial history of why that is the case and why that is maintained by our current system. So we're talking about primarily, like you're looking at white Americans owning 98% of US land. Next. Now, when you look at who owns the United States across the board, what you're really talking about is um, private land owners primarily own US land in the entirety of the United States. Then you have the federal and state governments owning the next largest amount of land followed by tribal authorities and then county and local governments. But private land ownership accounts for about 60% of owned U.S. land. Next slide. However, when you look at the makeup of it by region, what you will see is while private land ownership is primarily the case on the East Coast, Midwest, and some of the South, when you look at the West Coast or Southwest, you are actually primarily talking about federal public land ownership. And so this is very different than in other parts of the United States. So when we are talking about land return, a lot of people will think, wait, you're trying to take my house away from me. That's what you want, you want my house. Uh, of which I will always say to people, sure, I will take your house. Thank you very much. I love it. Uh, but no, what I'm really talking about are state and federal lands. 
And none of us, I think, can think that like state and federal lands are doing a great job at managing state and federal lands. So what would it mean to have indigenous peoples as those managers and as the owners of that land? And what would that look like in terms of what we could do to protect these lands uh, against climate change, to build climate resiliency? And what would it mean that then we're operating from a space of indigenous peoples making decisions about what a healthy river looks like or what does it look like to make sure that we have enough water for all communities? Like these are questions that we could ask on a very bigger scale if indigenous peoples were in charge. I do talk to people about how, like there was a moment, like a split second at the end of Obama's term uh, as president where he was thinking there, there was a suggestion that he could start giving parts of federal lands uh, especially federal parks back to indigenous peoples. And he, he, there was like a moment that people were like, could we do that? And then he was like, nah, because we got to worry about the protection of these lands. Now you turn around the next term, we have a new president, Donald Trump, and he immediately starts going, I'm going to frack, mine, and take apart federal lands. And guess what? Had they given those lands to indigenous peoples, that would have been an extra layer of protection against any kind of nonsense like that. So you start to see like where it's actually really beneficial to how we actually want to manage our lands. Next slide. This is a, another map of who owns the West where federal land makes up about 45% of California. And then you're also talking about state land and county land. So you're looking at over 50% of California primarily being not owned by individual landowners. But take a look at Nevada, which is 84.5% federal land. So to think about it in the case of what that means for the hoarding of natural resources, because that's primarily what's happening there. Um, next slide. Now, when we think about the uh, history of land dispossession in the United States, what you're looking at is like the consistent ways in which they are taking away indigenous lands and saying that now we're going to be in charge of them. And then what has that led to? Where has that brought us in this conversation about what sustainability or an environmental justice future actually looks like. Much of what uh, US history is about is the dispossession of indigenous lands and really has been about making sure that those lands are under the control of a settler government system that does not value and, ca and cannot really like value sustainability over capital uh, and capitalism. And so what does it mean when we wanna do different work and how is that supposed to look at the heart of putting indigenous peoples in the center of that? Next slide. Much of what happened in the United States were land grabs. It's important to like note that history is all about grabbing land and putting land into the possession of a settler colonial government system. So you're talking about removal being about land and taking land from Native people, treaties being about land and taking land, allotment being about land. The national and state parks are Indian land grabs. There's a reason why they're looking at these spaces and going, oh, we have to preserve them. Oh, and it happens to be that we're taking Indian land that we're going to preserve. They don't turn around and go like, oh, we have to protect it and then, you know, take back La Jolla and make it into a big, beautiful natural preserve because rich white people live there. But if you're looking at a place where it's primarily Native people, they're grabbing Native lands. The case of Yosemite is pretty clear about that. It's a Native land grab and then kicking Native people out of that place and saying we're preserving it. The same goes for the land grant universities, uh, a grab of Native land throughout the United States under the guise of giving it into educational systems. And then what you're seeing is being able to build giant endowments uh, for universities to make all kinds of money for the rest of their lives. And then you have Native peoples who are being kicked out of those areas. Next. So I think where, uh, where I end today is with the California Indian treaties to just remind people that we did negotiate treaties with the federal government, which would have guaranteed California Indians 7.5% uh, of the state or over 7 million acres. Um, they were negotiated and signed and subsequently unratified by Congress and then hidden under an injunction of secrecy. So this has always been about land, but when you trace the lands that were guaranteed versus the lands that were taken versus the lands that like are in native ownership right now, what you start to notice is a few things. One, we've never disconnected ourselves from our Aboriginal territories. Uh, we are very clear about our unbroken connection to our land spaces, even if we are not the owners of that land currently, it does not mean that we do not know it uh, as, as, as its story, its history, its life, 
and its importance to us. That's the first thing. The second thing I'll say is much of what we're talking about when we're talking about like, oh, but this is all free open land in the Central Valley for farming, or this was all free open land for building the wine industry, or this was all free open land for universities, were treaty lands for tribal peoples. And they were guaranteed and negotiated. And so when we're thinking about what it means that we're constantly displacing native peoples and then going, but we're doing good things with it, uh, now it's time to call into question why we're okay with that being a system that has created now wealth for colonial institutions to pass amongst themselves and never back to native peoples. Next slide. That is to say, there's a great report if you want to learn more about like the land grab universities. It's called Land Grab Universities. It'll show you the connection between the grabbing of indigenous lands and the building of some of our biggest educational systems in the United States. I highly recommend you read it. It does talk about like at the heart of this is also land return. I think when we're talking about what does it mean to build these systems, go to the next slide. Uh, we also need to talk about what it means to address these issues. And uh, if you're interested, there's a great article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, in which they state, until stolen land is returned, critical consciousness does not translate into action that disrupts settler colonialism. This is about and should always be about what we can do. And actually what has been shown through several of the movements for land return is what we can do is return land. It's not an impossibility. In fact, it when I experience it, it's some of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had is watching land be returned to indigenous peoples. Uh, it is something that I think creates community and possibility, uh, vibrancy and imagination beyond what we're living in right now. We can see a future forward. That's what land return is to me. And that's, I think, why uh, the Red Deal focuses in on this so much, because we always need to be saying the most powerful things out loud even if they feel far away from us. Um, because it wasn't too long ago that the Wiat tribe uh, came to the city of Eureka and said, what if you just gave us this island back, this sacred island? Uh, and they were like, that'll never happen. That's a dream that will never happen and we can never make that possible. What does that even look like? And then you fast forward 25 years later and they were returning that land to the Wiat tribe. So nothing's impossible anymore. You can't tell me that it's not, that it's impossible. Uh, I also end with this one. If we travel back in time and we met Thomas Jefferson, boo. Um, and he was telling us all about his plans for life. And we said, don't worry, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, in uh, 2021, we're going to have a Native woman in charge of um, the Department of the Interior, which is also going to put her in charge of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, so it'll be fine. Don't worry. We're going to go there. He would tell you that that's impossible that there would never be a native woman in charge of the Department of the Interior. He would tell you that that was an impossibility. And yet it happened. And Deb Holland is in charge of the Department of the Interior. So I feel like impossible things are happening in our lifetime every day. And we can't sit in just that's impossible or what could that even look like? We have to make it possible and bring it into being. So. We're gonna have a conversation today with um, Brittany and Dr. Murdoch about the possible, the possibilities of the Red Deal and moving forward. I'm gonna read both of their bios and then they're each gonna have time to talk and then we'll hopefully leave some time for questions. We just wanna encourage people, if you can, please put your questions into the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a section that says Q&A. If you click on it, you should be able to put questions into there. Uh, if you have comments or things you'd like to leave, please feel free to post them into the chat. We can see them. Um, you can also, after this talk is over, a lot of people are asking, where is it going to be? For now, you can view it on Facebook, uh, on our NAS Facebook page. It will be up there. But then following that as well, we are going to be putting them up onto our YouTube site likely in about uh, a week, they should be up there and then we'll be making announcements about being able to watch them. So that's housekeeping things. I have the privilege of introducing our two speakers. Brittany Orona is an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe in Northwestern California. She is an incoming assistant professor of American Indian Studies at San Diego State University uh, in fall of 2022 and is currently a PhD candidate at UC Davis in Native American Studies with a designated emphasis in human rights. 
She is on scholarly leave uh, in 2021-22 as a Mellon ACLS dissertation completion fellow. She's also a board advisor to Save California Salmon, an indigenous-led nonprofit focused on fisheries restoration, water quality, and healthy river systems throughout California. Uh, we also have Dr. Esme G. Murdoch, an assistant professor of American Indian Studies and associate director of the Institute for Ethics and Public Affairs at San Diego State University. Her research interests include environmental justice, indigenous and Afro-descended environmental ethics, settler colonial theory, and decolonization as land resource rematriation. Murdoch comes to this work as a descendant of enslaved Africans and European settlers in North America. Her work centers conceptions of land and relating to land found within both indigenous and African-American Afro-descended environmental philosophies. She has worked in environmental values, global ethics, Hypatia, agriculture and environmental ethics, and world philosophies. I would just like to say both of these amazing uh, women are at San Diego State University um, and, and the American Indian Studies Department. So I feel like uh, they're giving people a run for their money about where all the cool people are. So we should be very happy that they've joined us today. I'm very, very happy that they have. I'm gonna let uh, Brittany, I think if you wanna start it off and then we can go from there. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Katja. It's really awesome to be here. Can you see my slides? Okay, you can probably see my messy desktop too. Um, so, let me start from the beginning. Uh, so thank you so much. It's it's so exciting to be here. Um, and Katja did my introduction. I usually do like a little hoopa introduction, but um, I am currently on the lands of the Nisanan and Miwok peoples in the Sacramento Valley. And I'm really, really glad to be here. I keep saying that because I'm so excited to be in this uh, room with everybody and many friends who have joined on the panel as well, which I appreciate. appreciate. And so I, as I was um, getting ready for this talk, I was thinking about what I want to talk about because everybody, I hope, in this session knows that we need to give land back to Native peoples. Um, and we need to do that now because of the situation that we're in. But I was thinking and reflecting on my time uh, working for the state. So those of you that may know my history, those of you that may not, um, I worked for about 15 years for uh, federal, state, and local government. A special kind of torture, I guess. Um, but it was a really interesting and um, fascinating experience that gave me um, my ideas into the research that I do. So I look at um, the Klamath River Basin and the ways that policy and water infrastructure has affected the Klamath River Basin, and also how Hoopa, Yurok, Karuk, and the Klamath tribes have uh, used advocacy and art to define their worlds and also to remove four dams on that basin. And so I was reflecting on my time in the state, and it really amazed me how little people know about the history of California really how little people know about the history history of the United States, the native history of the United States, the native history of California. And so I'm not going to give like a whole history lesson here, um, but I really want to reflect on the ways in which history, reciprocity, and land back um, really merges into the present day. So I'm going to hide myself because I don't need to see myself talk. Um, but so this is something that um, I wanted to put out to the audience. How do we consider our past and our future? What do you know about California Indian history? Um, what do you know about United States history? What do you know about the history of indigenous people around the world? Uh, growing up as a Hoopa tribal member, I learned all of this um, through stories from my grandfather, from elders, from family. Um, but it was really bits and pieces, like getting through the structure of the state, how um, water infrastructure really impacts my peoples up on the Klamath River Basin, how agriculture has really been made um, a prime product here in California, um, and how Native peoples have been dispossessed from their lands through violence, uh, genocide, and through um, policy. So my dissertation really looks at the ways in which those two things go hand in hand, how policy and how genocidal violence goes hand in hand in the dispossession and violence against Native people, specifically in California and Oregon, but also Native people uh, 
across the United States and around the world. And so I asked this question, how do we consider our past and our future? Because our past is very much tied into our future and our present. So this is a picture of hydraulic mining, which was not legal in California for a very long time, but um, may still has impacts upon the landscape today. So we're still dealing with environmental remediation from hydraulic mining. So mountains, if you don't know what hydraulic mining is, it's pretty much what this picture says. Um, it's blasting away mountainsides in the search of gold. So gold at the beginning of California's inception was the resources, resource that people um, were coming in to get. But as more people flooded into the state, agriculture and water development becomes the um, primary focus for uh, settlers into the region. And so I bring this up because I wanna point out that infrastructure affects our lives every day into the present, um, the way in which we get water, how we get agriculture um, really impacts not just native people, but you as well. If you're in Humboldt County, you probably know the history of water diversions um, from the basin area down to Southern California and Central Valley for agricultural purposes and for uh, metropolitan water usage. So I mentioned this because the formation of California history is really based, really impacts into our present day situation. And I think the Red uh, Nation, the New Deal, the, sorry, the Red, deal does a really good job of connecting those, those things as well. What happened in the past, native dispossession, environmental mismanagement, environmental change impacts us into the present and into the future. And as Kutcha said, native connection to land runs deep. This is a um, painting from Lynn Risling, a uh, Hoopa Yurok and Kruk artist. I'm sure many of you know who Lynn is. Um, she features heavily into my dissertation, but I'm really interested in the ways in which we connect our histories as native peoples and consider it. Our connection to the land runs deep no matter where we're at. So um, when I was working, not to bring it back to the state, but when I was working for the state, I get questions like, oh, well, do native people there is no native people in cities. And it's like, well, there's a lot of native peoples in cities if you think about the urban native population and also the native people who are indigenous to that region. So here in the Sacramento Valley, we get a lot of, um, there are a lot of Miwok Nesanon tribes who are still very active in, in um, reclaiming their lands and also in um, designating their histories and talking about their histories into that place. So as a historian, I find it very interesting that how little people know of the places that they're at. And I urge you as an audience, if you are in a locale and you don't know the history of where you're at, to go and seek it and find it and um, really figure how the area that you're at became the area that you're at. I think that's, that's actually very important to do. So this is a, a painting from uh, Brian Tripp. Uh, I want to gripe on ongoing occupation of Indian country. It makes me angry. So really, this is at the forefront of a lot of Native people's minds. And it's at the forefront of my mind every day. I walk around and I think about how I am a colonized person on a colonized place. And how am I going to do the work to both teach people history, um, the history of California, the United States, of indigenous people around the world. But also beyond that, how am I working towards indigenous solidarities? So um, I really enjoyed reading the Red Deal. The Red Deal, I thought it was um, very actionable, but also talks about uh, some of the things that we can do as people through uh, to decolonize not just our minds, but ourselves as well. So I put decolonization is not a metaphor. Really, it's not. It's not. Um, and Kutcha had put really great examples about the Wiat, Wiat's uh, return of uh, Tulawat. And I talk a little bit about that at the end, but it's it's not an impossibility. So when I talk to non-Native people about the history of California, 
and the history of the United States and indigenous dispossession and violence, there's a lot of, wow, I didn't know this. It's really sad. And then, oh, well, what are we going to do now? There's actually a lot that we can do now uh, towards indigenous justice and solidarities with other movements as well. So, of course, um, in the Red Nation, they put they put divest, heal our bodies, heal our planet. Um, and I think that if you read the book, and I hope that you have read the book, there's a lot of great points such as free and sustainable housing, free accessible um, education, sustainable agriculture, which to me was a really big, big one as I study um, the history of water divestment in the state of California. Uh, land, water, air, and animal restoration. All of these things sound really great to me. Um, and I hope they sound really great to you as well. And so I'm not really treating this, as you could tell, this talk as an academic talk, but really more of my reflections on being a historian and um, doing this environmental historic work and what I'm seeing. So indigenous solidarity, something that I like to point out to people, um, you know, the way that Native peoples are often discussed in US history books. Um, if you learned about Native peoples when you were in fourth grade and you did the mission project here in California. And for those of you that are not Californian, the mission project is you make little sugar cube missions. And then the teacher usually has you talk about how great the mission system was, it wasn't a great system for Native peoples. Um, that colonization started in 1769 and obviously impacts into the present. But something that I do like to say is um, we resisted. We resisted at every turn. Uh, Mission San Gabriel is a great example of resistance. Um, we survived. Uh, this horrible genocide and have always advocated for ourselves, our peoples and our lands. And that goes up into the present day. So on the left-hand side is a protest, no water for profit, Native peoples in the North Coast in uh, Northern California, Central Southern California have continuously fought back against water agencies that have sought to divest water um, from different river systems. Um, Native people join together in these movements to ensure that any policy or regulation that has to do with water or land management that tribes are involved in. Um, and those cross different lines. So many Native people from Northern California, um, Hupa, Yurok, Kruk, Klamath tribes traveled during the No Dapple protest to um, Standing Rock to express their solidarity with the Standing Rock a tribe as they were fighting that pipeline. Native peoples crossed different borders to go and stand in solidarity with each other uh, through different movements, Black Lives Matter um, being a very pivotal movement as well. So I, I, do, I do like to point out that throughout history that this has been an important component of um, indigenous actions. Um, we didn't just lay down and die um, we didn't just disappear from these narratives. We have always been a part of those narratives. And the reason I bring that up too is because as I'm reading through uh, water histories that are written by predominantly um, white male historians, there's always just like this small little mention. It's like, well, native people are here. Well, they're gone now. And that's just simply not true. If you're writing a history about land in the United States, you can't leave native people out of it. Um, because we figure so heavily into that history and have always fought back against um, the state governments and the federal governments and um, settlers who have tried to dispossess of, possess us of our, our place. So on the left hand side is a picture of a protest from Columbus Day. It's a Red Nation uh, protest. So no pride in genocide, really pointing out um, the the um, legacy of Columbus Day and that person. And on the right is a picture of Bear Ears. And I bring that instance up because there, there is a lot of indigenous advocacy around Bear Ears. Um, Kutcha being you know, a, a person who has written about that space. But also um, I like to bring out up that something that actually jumping off of what Kutcha 
brought up as where, well, the bare ears protect the site that's protected has gone through so many administration changes. And so I guess I would like us to reflect upon what it means when an administration changes and then suddenly an area is unprotected and then protected. Um, it's protected from resources, man um, resource extraction. And then in the next administration, typically Democrat, it's then protected under um, certain settler colonial land management standards. So I think that we have to think, we have to consider the ways in which the government continuously flip-flops and how there's no really standard in environmental management practices. It's the same with um, gubernatorial administrations. So there are some gubernatorial um, administrations that continue the legacies of uh, land bad land management practices into the present. So I'm thinking here of the Newsom and uh, Governor Brown administration that has carried on um, this really bad history of perpetuating water infrastructure in the state. So again, just listen to native people. Like we, we know our lands better than anyone else. And we're actually very, very well versed in the histories of our lands as well, because we've seen it all. So comes to my point about land back. Having control over our, over our ancestral territories is vital to our ability to care for them and is a generations long pathway to true sustainability. Only when land is restored and returned can we begin to rebuild our economies and our nations with true sovereignty. Having a say in how the land is cared for would allow us to reassert our relations with the land and our non-human relatives, which is the basis upon which indigenous people define their nations and sovereignty. So that's a quote from the Red Nation and I thought that was a very um, powerful quote and gets to the heart of land back. And as Kutcha said, land back is not kicking everybody out. I get that question all the time too, and I never quite understand it. Um, and as my friend Hoopa scholar Stephanie Lumsden has said, and she's on this uh, call right now, our indigenous ethics don't do that. Like, right, like our, our basic ethics at the core of who we are as indigenous people is not kicking everybody off the land, um, but it's working towards this sustainability and this protection of the environment um, and this rebu rebuilding of our nations uh, through sovereignty, through our relationships with land and non-human relatives. So I think about that a lot um, in being a hoopa person because at the basis of it for me, it's like, what is my responsibility in both writing the history of my peoples as it relates to water um, and water divestment, water management, water policy, settler colonial stuff. Um, and then what is my relationship and responsibility then to other indigenous nations, other allied uh, people in their, in their um, struggles towards liberation so I think that's something that we should all be considering as we're um, moving through this world. How does our history inform our present and how does our history and present inform the future? So uh, Kutcha talked about this, of course, and um, land back in We Out ter Territory, um, the We Out Tribe did so much advocacy over the years um, to get their Tuluwa Island back. And the reason I mention um, Tuluwa Island, um, it's because of the, the massacre that occurred there in 1860. And that, and because of the strength and, res I don't wanna say, res well, yeah, the strength and resilience and survivance of we are peoples to um, get to, to return this land and then also to, um, you know, work towards remediation. I mean, there's a lot of environmental violence that happened on this land. There's also genocidal violence, of course, that happened on this land. But really, the We Out people have um, shown the way in which Native peoples can get their land return, lands returned back. Um, through this intensive advocacy that they did through never forgetting this island. And um, 
as a Hoopa person, I went to Humboldt State and my family is up there. And I always knew the history of um, this island as well. And that's really important when we're thinking about um, land back efforts and how it connects to indigenous sovereignty today. So um, I'm gonna, I think I, I have about two more minutes, but I'm probably gonna end with this quote. Um, I think about this quote a lot, actually. I saw it in 2013, right before uh, Charlie Hill passed away. And if you know who Charlie Hill is, he's a very famous um, native comedian. But he wrote, if people don't know Native people, they don't know America. Americans don't know anything about us. They don't know anything about themselves. When Americans don't know Indian people, they must look at their own world, their own science, their arts, their medicine in the same myopic way. It's right in their faces. And it's like, they don't get it. So I think about this a lot because I really believe that's true. Um, when I work with non-Native environmental scientists, it's a very narrow way of seeing the world. It's a very narrow way of thinking about the place that we're in now, because as I've said over and over during this talk, history informs our present. You can't understand environment, the environment without understanding both the relationship that Indigenous people have to that environment, or at least attempting to understand that and to listen to Native peoples, but also in understanding how settler colonial violence um, shaped our landscape today. Because here in California, here in the United States, the way that we are now is not the way that we've always been. And so I'd ask you to consider how you are bringing your own knowledge of the historic past into the present and into the future. Um, to provide justice for Native people. And I think that's it for me. Thank you, Brittany. That was amazing. Um, what a way to get us started. I We're going to pass it on to uh, Dr. Murdoch. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much um, for inviting me to be here. I'm so honored um, to be here and sharing some of um, my work and some of my thoughts. And thank you so much, Brittany. That was such a powerful um, presentation and it's got me thinking of all sorts of things. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking about um, some of the things that, that interest me. Um, I didn't come up with my own title because titles are really hard for me. So I just used the panel um, title. And on the right hand side, I have a picture. This is actually um, at UC Davis. So this is Nisanan and Miwok territory. Um, and a lot of my work involves um, philosophies that look at trees um, as relatives, trees as kin, and also trees as witnesses and participants and agents in histories, um, both Afro-descended and um, indigenous on Turtle Island. So you'll see that there is an overrepresentation of trees um, in the, the visuals for my, um, for my presentation. Okay, so as a way of introduction, I found that I really like um, doing this in terms of thinking about the lands that made me and the lands that make me. And one of the things I'm really interested in thinking about, especially um, with notions of decolonization and decolonization as not being a metaphor, is the ways that um, settler dominant Western conceptions of land um, commodify land and talk about land in a very particular way as an object, a commodity, a scientific object. Um, and so I like to think about the ways that land is not interchangeable. It's not like a fungible commodity that can just be replaced with another, um, another sort of like parcel or object status kind of understanding of land. And so in this instance, and I could put more lands here, um, some of the pictures I'm going to show are from Muskogee territory too, where I've also lived and worked. Um, but I just wanted to say that I was born and raised in Algonquin territory, commonly referred to as Connecticut. Um, in Algonquin speaking peoples um, called the place that I'm from the Long Waterland. 
Um, I trained and studied in Anishinaabewaki, which is commonly referred to as Michigan. Um, and I um, was really, really shaped by Anishinaabe philosophy and the Anishinaabe lands um, that I was related to um, when I was doing my, uh, my PhD work. And then of course, I'm currently living and working in Kumeyaay, um, which is commonly referred to as San Diego. So I want to sort of forefront this as, as, as a way of, of thinking about land in a more capacious way of thinking about land as having power and personality and as being different and as also making possible, right? Like all the things that we do. Um, and so thinking about that in terms of this as being an ongoing process, right? Of being a good relative, of being related to land. Um, and part of the way I was raised was to think about, um, you know, the world, <laughs> the land, the waters as, um, as being surrounded by, um, by teachers, right? There are teachers everywhere. So thinking about, you know, like what happens when we embrace that kind of um, perspective and that kind of philosophy um, and what happens when we think in ways that are, um, that give space to that kind of understanding. And so I love to think about the power of personality and also how, you know, different places affect you. That's the spiritual power of, of the land and of, of ancestors. And so thinking about um, what that means. Okay. Um, so here's another photo um, on the left-hand side. It's this tree um, that was um, in Atlanta. So on, um, you know, seeded or stolen uh, Muscogee lands. Um, and uh, it just, I don't know, it was calling out for me to, <laughs> to, um, to witness, right, this, um, this, this relative, this, um, this uh, kin. And, um, and I also liked the juxtaposition of, right, like this, like very, to me, the house in the background looks very colonial. Um, and then you have this like fence, right? This like kind of violent fence separating the tree from um, the sidewalk in this instance. And so part of the thing that I want to talk about, especially um, in terms of thinking about what I do in my work is thinking decolonization and abolition together, which is um, I think part of what the Red Deal and the Red Nation does so um, beautifully, right? Is to think about like the worlds that were brought together um, through settler colonialism and also the worlds that were targeted for extinction, right? And um, they were not extinguished, right? But thinking about um, those worlds together, especially as um, a black person on Turtle Island, right? My question is always, how do I be a good relative, right? Like, how do I understand what it is to be black on indigenous lands? Um, and so this idea of decolonization and abolition and thinking it together, I think it's really useful because it also draws into um, draws into the frame, right? Um, for black people and indigenous people are shared histories in the space of um, Turtle Island. And so I don't think that <laughs> decolonization and abolition are at cross purposes, right? I think that they're both about um, imagining a different kind of world right, um, or many worlds, right, of being capable of existing in the same space and sort of rejecting and pushing back on the inheritances that we have as um, colonized people, right, as indigenous people, as, um, right, because um, thinking about, um, you know, enslaved Africans as displaced and dispossessed indigenous peoples from Africa, right, and thinking about the, um, the sort of ways that settler colonial domination wants us to think in these very um, divisive, exclusive sort of categories and wants us to think, and I think perhaps this is perhaps why so many people push back against, um, um, push back against um, land back, right, um, as a movement and as a, a, a way of thinking about how to create better worlds, right, is precisely because of this really this internalization of this dominating system, right? That tells us that, right? Like um, we only get power by being um, above someone else, by dominating someone else. That the only way to in, in, um, imagine freedom is to think about you as, or you or your people as being in a position of dominating other people, which is for indigenous and Afro-diasporic philosophies completely untrue, right? So thinking about what does it actually mean to reckon with, you know, when that, when that voice comes out, when you have that kind of um, response and that defensiveness, like what actually needs to be worked on? Um, and one of the things that I think about, right, there's this quote that um, Toni Morrison said in an interview, 
Um, and she said, in terms of thinking about this kind of domination and hierarchy, she said, if you can only be tall because another person is on their knees, right? That's a very serious problem, right? And that's a problem you need to think about in terms of like doing your own work to heal from that as being your understanding um, of the world. And I also think that, um, you know, the work of the black radical tradition is very much, um, has, a, has an affinity with, you know, this work on decolonization, especially in Turtle Island um, and indigenous philosophies, right, of thinking about, um, you know, how the colony itself has to be abolished. That's how we build new worlds. Um, and so that we have this system is because of the political um, and ecological work of a lot of people over a period of time, but we also have the ability to dismantle it, right, to build different things. And I think that that's really exciting and really hopeful. Um, and so I think that thinking decolonization and abolition together is really, um, is really powerful. Okay, and then the next thing that I took from um, the Red Nation, the Red Deal, and thinking also about um, some of my work, and this is on the left-hand side, this is a picture um, of Anishinaabe territory. This is, um, I think it's actually called Empire Michigan. Um, and it's got, you know, the sand and the sand dunes and these beautiful um, ecosystems that, that, um, that flourish there and these relatives that grow there in relationship with others. Um, and so the, this category, this um, concept of caretaking and making kin, I thought was so, beautifully expressed in the Red Deal and also so important to think about, right? Like how is the world made, right? The world is made through these caretaking practices, right? That in a capitalist economy, in a dominant settler colonial um, society really, um, uh, you know, diminishes the, the power of caretaking um, and sees caretaking as like, you know, this sort of um, high, uh, hidden um, sort of economy or um, something that doesn't produce, uh, it doesn't produce profit, um, but it produces immense value and it actually provides the conditions for people who think that they're independent to function, right? So like um, thinking about this whole like sort of shadow economy and not even thinking of it in terms of an economy, but like just a way that the world is reproduced, right? Constantly and who's doing that work? Right, um, and thinking about also the um, shared, and I, I make this connection in my work, the shared um, philosophies of a relationality and making kin in Afro um, descended and also indigenous um, philosophies of, um, of ethics and relationship, right? So um, one of the points I make is that, you know, one of the things I learned through my research, I didn't learn this um, like in formal education, right? And we can think about perhaps why, the reasons why we don't learn these things in formal education, right? Was the intense um, expertise that um, Western and Central African people had in terms of ethnobotanical uh, knowledge and how that was actually targeted in terms of the places that were um, um, specified for human trafficking for enslavement, right? Um, so most of my work right now is looking at, and my book is looking at the sea coastal history of um, South Carolina, which when it was a colony was called the Carolina colony. Um, and the Carolina colony was actually a, one of the only colonies in the deep south um, and the southeast coast of Turtle Island that was not a cotton economy. It wasn't a cotton colony, it was a rice colony. And um, in order for that, for rice to be like the, the um, cash crop of that um, colony that provided for the success, right, and the settlement of, um, of those indigenous lands, right, uh, in South Carolina, um, it relied on the ethnobotanical knowledge of West African peoples who were ricing peoples, right, who um, grew rice in riverine contexts and in inland contexts and in um, coastal contexts. Um, and so, you know, even the whitewashing of history in Carolina and, and South Carolina will still say things like, oh, was it, you know, in, was it Africans who really had this knowledge or did it, was it just like settlers, you know, European settlers who taught them to do this? Well, actually, no, it was, <laughs> um, it was African peoples who had this intense intensive and specialized knowledge um, from the relationships they have with their land and they, um, you know, 
built those relationships in a, in a different place. Um, and so, and also thinking of like the, um, the kin that were brought over with enslaved peoples, right? So thinking about, you know, people braided um, seeds in their hair, right? And thinking about how, you know, slavery did not provide, um, was not a caretaking economy in terms of taking care of um, um, the people that were enslaved. Um, and so that what that meant was that people had to, you know, do their own do their own farming, do their own gardening. Um, coastal peoples had their own um, their own rice beds, right? And thinking about um, how they provided for themselves in really, you know, not ideal and horrific conditions. Um, and so it's my argument that, right, um, enslaved African peoples and their descendants have always made kin, right? They have always made kin with other humans. They've always made kin with other beings. Um, and they've made kin with the lands um, that they were um, forcibly brought to and trafficked to. Um, so thinking about, right, how is it that we support each other through taking care um, and through making kin and pushing back against this dominant um, tendency to tell us that land is only an object or land is only a commodity or only useful in terms of its exchange value or it's um, what we can um, sort of get for it in terms of like monetary um, wealth. It's so much more than that. And I think that um, the way that the caretaking and making kin were centralized in the Red Deal is really, um, is really special and important to think about. Um, and so this um, photo on the right hand side is this giant um, tree that is on my primary research site, which is McLeod Plantation, um, which is on uh, James Island. Um, off the coast of um, South Carolina. And you can see it's just massive and it has, you know, Spanish oak or a uh, Spanish moss um, draped all around it. Um, and this was really the place where <laughs> the sort of like abstract idea that trees are relatives and trees are witnesses was made concrete for me through my experiences in this place and with um, not this particular tree, but another tree on the plantation. Um, and so I pulled out this quote that's from the Red Deal um, and the Red Nation, and it's the sort of tail end of a quote where it says, a world where many worlds fit. And I thought that that was really um, powerful in terms of especially thinking about, um, you know, our um, relatives, especially in Latin America and South America, who are doing, um, you know, this food sovereignty work that we're also doing here, but in different ways. Um, and then also this, um, this decolonization and, um, anti-coloniality uh, sort of um, work that's happening there. And it's just, to me, right, this idea of there being multiple worlds that can fit together is just really beautiful and exciting. And I think it's not new, right? We can think about, right, like um, the, um, the variety and diversity of nations, of native nations in the context of Turtle Island, right, that existed in their difference and respected others' difference, right, didn't try to um, flatten other worlds in order to produce like a dominant one uh, world to rule them all kind of situation, which is what we have through imperialism and through um, colonialism. Um, and I think that also expanding it even beyond the, co the, the context, which is, again, a dominant way of thinking of just thinking about um, human diversity, but actually thinking about, right, like the, um, the more than human world as a place of many worlds, right, as a place of many different kinds of relatives, um, kinds of beings, and the power that those um, relatives have, um, and that they sometimes, right, share with us and exert in and um, interrupt perhaps our sort of everyday um, uh, conditioning in a settler colonial um, state. And so I think that, you know, part of what the limitation in terms of thinking about how people are very nervous and, and scared of land back, right, is precisely this imaginative um, limitation that settler colonialism takes away from all of us. And so I think that um, thinking about these different um, how everything doesn't have to be compatible in order to fit, right? It just has to be respected. Um, and I think that respecting the difference and the power of personality of different lands, of different waters, and of different places and peoples is incredibly important. And wouldn't it be so wonderful to have a world where many worlds fit and also to take care of each other? And I think that's um, where I'll end. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much to to both uh, Dr. Murdoch and to Brittany. I think that there was a lot that was um, said that people are going to take with them. I think we're building like both a philosophical but also a practical conversation around decolonization and what this looks like. I think that's also what the Red Nation was trying to do, right? Is sort of to say there's the there's the philosophical kind of intervention, and then there's the what can we do in community? What can we make happen? And what does this look like? Um, we do have some questions in the chat. And I'd like to get to at least a few of them if we can. Uh, the first one is uh, for anyone. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between infrastructure and U.S. empire. Can you all say more about how infrastructure reproduces the state and also perpetuates modes of dispossession? Yes, <laughs> I can. Um, so whenever I start talking about water infrastructure, which is what my main focus is, I always um, begin with the first California legislature in 1850. So for those of you who maybe are not well versed in California Indian, I'm sorry, California history, um, you know, the gold rush starts in earnest in 1848. And then almost as soon after that, the state forms itself. So it forms itself through um, the California, the first legislature that is enacted in 1850. And during this legislative um, period, it's the height of California Indian genocide. Um, Native people are being killed uh, through militia campaigns, both for the federal and state government, and um, are being systematically removed off their lands. And through that, they're being removed off their lands through laws as well. So in 1850, um, the state legislature passed an act for the government and protection of Indians. And while that name sounds really nice, it's uh, very misleading. Um, so it's a, a law that um, removes Native children from their families, indentures Native children to um, adult white settlers. Um, it facilitates the removal of Native peoples from their traditional lands and um, is also a uh, vagrancy law. So there's a lot that goes into that law. And so the reason that I point that out is because at the same time that this legislature is in session, they're also developing water plans. So they're already talking about the development of water infrastructure in the state of California. So those two things go hand in hand when you're considering the ways in which both the federal government and the state government forms itself. So the Bureau of Reclamation um, is formed in, 1902 through um, federal government. And the purpose of the Bureau of Reclamation is to build dams and canals to make the West useful. So meaning the West is considered arid and dry. So how are we gonna move water um, to different areas and areas that maybe shouldn't be farmed? That's my own my editorial, um, editor editorializing. But areas that are very arid um, become farmlands. So we see it in California. We see it in Southern, or Southern Oregon. Uh, we see it across the West. And so the state, the United States really forms itself through these massive water infrastructure projects and off the backs of um, this violence against Native people that is occurring in um, the region in the area across the American West. So the formation of the United States and the formation of uh, California government and the formation of all the states in the West really has, um, is really hand in hand with these reclamation projects that occur and these infrastructure projects that occur. And I wanna note that dams that were built during that time are pretty much crumbling right now. And there is a lot of concern from communities, not just in California, but across uh, the United States where these dams are built about dams fail failing um, and the usefulness of these projects now. So I, I won't go too much more into that, but I just wanna point out that these laws and policies that are formed um, related to environmental infrastructure often are formed um, because of the genocidal violence against Native people and to remove Native people off of these places. Uh, 
Asmi, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just add really quickly. I think something the Red Deal does pretty well is, is focus on some of these moments, right? Like in thinking about the way, right? Like, so the United States was not inevitable, right? It's only possible through these practices of genocide and dispossession and enslavement. And also um, the way that, the, that um, indigenous land um, continues to be used as the way that the United States government, you know, sort of bails itself out of whatever economic crisis arises, right? So the connection between, you know, um, the New Deal, right, the Indian Reorganization Act, and, um, you know, the um, sort of mitigation of the Great Depression, right, through that economic industrial development and infrastructure, a lot of which was da were dams, right? And then also the same thing when you look at the Great Recession of 2008, right, and how um, you know, the, um, the, the seizure and, and theft of, of native land, again, right, is used as a way to um, establish capital, right, establish the capital that then becomes, right, the, the sort of subject of distribution or maldistribution elsewhere. Um, so I think that, and then you can think about land grabs also, right, those, right, research universities are built, right, with um, the, uh, the, with indigenous land and with, you um, enslaved labor, right? And that's not something that is reflected when people want to have talks about how uh, resources are shared or um, who, go who gets to attend or go to or, or um, have access to the resources that those universities make possible. I really, I really appreciate all the points that you all made. I, I think that when people start to understand a connection between infrastructure and even like how we build the state and then colonialism and imperialism and this idea of pushing certain people out to bring certain people in as laborers to push those people out. I, I really think a lot about like the Los Angeles River in that context and what they did to that river. I'm always telling people like there's supposed to be a river in Los Angeles. There's supposed to be like a vibrancy of like water and connection to place to think about the use of pavement in that to sort of like try to control a landscape, but also control a people um, and what that means. So I think that people take for granted that this is what California is supposed to look like, just kind of how it is. There was a great map that somebody made that was uh, from the, for the big think that was showing people that there was a lake, there was a giant lake in Southern California that doesn't exist anymore but that we're supposed to be much greener, much like there's supposed to be much more water. The desert that exists in the middle of California is sort of historically made. Um, I think that those are things that people don't think about in context because in their mind, it's our, it's our lived memory that is what is California, not a 150 year history of how they make California into the image of really what is the overuse of resources. Um, that's what it's always been about, so. I do, I wanna pause here for a second to do our drawing because I don't, I know some people might have to jet off and then I'm gonna end with one more question for our panelists. Um, so let's bring up the screen, Katie, if we can with those and you have to be present to win. So we have to keep drawing until we get someone present to win. Um, but I can't, I think I can't do it. So you have to share it, Katie. Oh no, it's just a, it's hilarious. Well, you can spin the wheel and tell us who won, um, Katie, and then we can see if the person's here. This is to win a copy of the Red Deal. And uh, and you will get, we will get it sent to you. So we're gonna, we'll announce who, who wins the spin. If you're here, you just have to say, yes, I'm here. And then we will follow up with you, uh, get your information so we can send you a copy of the book. She said she's spinning. I'm, it's Matt Johnson. Is Matt Johnson still here? Matt Johnson, are you still here? All right, Matt Johnson wins a copy of The Red Deal, everyone. I, I already have comment. That's good, I love it. Okay, our ending question for today uh, for our two panelists, um, I, I will post to you all here. So here we go. How does care get minimized by the heteropatriarchal ideology of the state? How is decolonization also a feminist project? So we'll end there for the, like the final words you'd like to give us on decolonization uh, as a feminist project or even any other kind of like final thoughts you'd like to give us. Uh, 
You want me to start, Brittany? <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, care is absolutely minimized and degraded in a hetero heteropatriarchal state, right? In terms of just thinking of the division of labor, also like what makes what makes these concepts that we have that we're so like the settler dominant society is so um, uh, militant about defending, right? Like independence, autonomy, right? Like um, things like that. They're all produced on the backs of, of, of people who um, do this care work, right? Which is incredibly minimized. It's underpaid or not paid, right? It's not compensated or it's undercompensated. Um, and it's this, um, this, this constant project of social reproduction that is pushed to the shadows and invisibilized, right? So thinking about, um, and thinking about what that means to our um, like to our collective um, traditions and history, right? Like thinking about how you know the the like for, I'll speak for myself, right? Like in terms of thinking about how there's always this like idea of economic or laborious uh, contributions of Black people to like whatever the settler state is now, right? But at the same time, it's like thinking about like how their knowledges, their traditional knowledges, their ethnobotanical knowledges, right? Their um, relations with with other people and with other uh, more than human kin, right, were a type of relationship. They were a type of care work, right, that's not actually encapsulated in this understanding of um, capital um, or labor as like this exchange value. Um, and it's not valued in, uh, historically either. And so I think that um, when you look at like, for example, environmental justice movements, when you look at who's actually on the ground doing that work, right, it's women, it's women of color, right, and they're never really the faces of those movements or the faces of um, environmentalism more generally. And if we, you know, blow like zoom out and think about that in terms of a global context, right, there are so many, um, you know, women um, and, um, um, you know, femme people who are doing this kind of this labor and this work and the state constantly wants to minimize and uh, detract from the ways that it's entirely dependent on that on that work and that it would not function um, without it so thinking about um, I mean it's it's just crucial to think about how we can also even expand our notion of the value of care work and caretaking um, to be something that we can um, you know think about in a way that we value and that we honor. And I think that that's, um, that's important. I agree <laughs> with, with every, everything uh, Dr. Murdoch said. Uh, I, would, I would add right now, like to look at who, I, I was thinking about this today because um, the COP26 is going on terrible acronym, um, but COP26 is going on right now. And there have been a few like pieces that have been written about it and um, related to like who is there and who's sitting on these panels right now. And it's all white male leaders of these countries. And I think you have to ask yourself, ourselves about the role in which those people play in uh, the continued uh, climate crisis and the continued adherence to capitalism and the adherence to um, an unsustainable world. So why are these people the ones talking right now? <laughs> like they should be the ones that are, sorry, I'm going like this because they're talking and then like they should uh, not be the ones that are at the forefront of this. And so I think about it in terms of my own experience in working on a local level um, with the Klamath. I, I talk a lot about the Klamath. I'm sorry. It's just on my mind right now. Um, I'm in dissertation mode. But I think a lot about the people on the Klamath who are doing this really hard work. And it's, you know, uh, women, it's it's um, femmes, it's, um, you know, allied people who are really going out there and putting themselves on the front line of these, uh, this crisis and saying, we don't have to live in this world and the world that we're, we, um, that has been um, made for us. And I like to call back to, to Kutcha's point about um, history and how people think that this is the way it's always been and it's not like the world that we live in now 
has been made through colonialism, settler colonialism, uh, heteropatriarchy, all of like the bad things that we think of, um, at least that I think of um, when I'm walking down the street day to day. But there's still like this idea, this radical imagination that we could all have to remake our worlds and to make it better. Um, and I think about those people like my great great grandmother who hid in the woods from um, soldiers from Fort Gaston in Hoopa Valley and hid there for two years with her son. And I think about those people when I'm thinking about how, um, how we have always resisted and how we continue to resist um, through advocacy and through um, you know, solidarities, solidarities and kinship support. And I think that really, really matters as we're moving forward. So um, I, I all end on that. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. I just want to let everyone know that you can pick up a copy of the Red Deal, um, order it, get a copy, read it, and think about like the ways in which you want to look at uh, the work that you're already doing, the work you could do, even what you want to talk about when you're given space to talk about what could this future look like and should we be focusing on, on more because there is more that needs to be done. I, I'm going to read one part of the Red Deal to end today. Um, and But before we do that, I want to make sure that Katie puts into the chat the flyer for next week's talk right now. Native American Studies is hosting an ongoing series of discussions uh, for the around food sovereignty. We are featuring one book for our food sovereignty book talk series this semester, Indigenous Food Systems, Concepts, Cases, and Conversations. And authors from the chapters are coming to talk each week, uh, Mondays in November from 3.30 to 4.30 Pacific time. It's on our Facebook Live, but you can also register to attend. It's an opportunity to learn from Indigenous peoples about food sovereignty and uh, the future of food sovereignty. So to end today, I'm gonna to read a quote from the Red Deal to remind us like why we do the work that we do, what we can do moving forward. And it says this, the caretaking economy is already in place. Three quarters of land-based environments and two thirds of marine environments have been affected by capitalist development, but environmental degradation has been less severe in places managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. While making up only 5% of the world's population, Indigenous peoples protect 80% of the planet's biodiversity. Indigenous peoples and local communities who have distinct cultural and social ties to ancestral homelands and bioregions still caretake at least a quarter of the world's land. This includes places that are the lungs of the world, such as the Amazon rainforest and its veins, like the Missouri River Basin. Areas facing existential threats of deforestation, damming, water contamination, oil and gas development, and mining. Indigenous people protect the land, air, and water we all need to live. So we will end there. We thank everyone for attending today. Encourage you to please attend our Food Sovereignty Lab speaker series. Feel free to thank our speakers in the chat. Let them know uh, how they did today, um, and we thank them again for coming and being a part of this. We also encourage people, uh, if you're wondering, uh, the there's some really cool stuff happening at San Diego State. Um, and so to think about the American Indian Studies Department there, uh, also uh, the, the ways that we can work across our campuses and colleges. Thanks everyone. We will see you again soon. <laughs>